Good morning, everyone. And yes, once again, I'm sitting on my porch. And the reason why I'm on my porch is because Bear had to go potty. And for some reason, Bear likes for his mommy to be with him, to watch him go potty. So I take that as a great honor when your dog or your cat wants you to watch them as they go potty. So honestly, no matter what the weather is, if it's raining, I'll put on something to keep the rain off of me as I sit in my rocking chair. Or right now I have a blanket on me because it's quite chilly and it's foggy. The reason why I am talking this morning is because there are things that are on my mind. There are lots of you who have children who are incarcerated. I have a son who's incarcerated. He's been incarcerated for over 20 years. And our communications with each other, it's not good. My son blames me for a lot of things. I tried to tell him my side of the story. Since he wasn't there, he's he hasn't been there for 20 years. But he believes other people. He doesn't believe his mother. Um, the latest incident has something to do with somebody posting something on... Facebook and a person saw it and they got confused and they they asked somebody a question who came to me and asked me a question so I I went to the person who would have had an answer um you know who and um I asked and they're like well who did this and I let them know you know, showed them the Facebook thing. So just asking a question, just my son called and basically once again laid me the hell out. Really. I just asked a question, simple question that could have been a yes or no answer. That's all. And he called and said that I was getting into his business. And I let him know that I was not getting into his business. But there was a rumor that was going out. You know, in public. So I went to the person who I should have asked. Who people should have asked. And um, he did not like that. He doesn't like a lot of things that I have done. Because people tell him. People, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having one of those moments. My doctors call it word recognition. It has to do with TBI mixed with PTSD. So sometimes I try to use a word, a simple word, and even the simple word won't come out. So I will try that again. Instead of listening to his mother who has never lied to him, who tried to be as supportive as I could, uh, he would listen to other people and then lay me out. You can't see much through my, my phone right now. It's early morning and it's foggy. You should see this fog. I mean, you could do a zombie uh, movie just through this fog or... Or another Jurassic Park thing where something comes out of the fog and tries to eat you. Thank God I have a white dog. I can see him because if Bear was black, I wouldn't be able to see him right now. Anyway, getting back to this. It's horrible. It's, it's horrible. It has come down to me where... It's better for me not to have communications with my son because I have to protect myself. 
my psyche. It's abusive. It's abusive. And I don't deserve that. I don't. I really do not deserve that. I tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, because there's no reason for me to lie. And he believes other people. So I have to stop communications. I don't want to. I really don't want to. But I have to for my own psyche. It's not right when a person doesn't believe his mother. Why would I lie? I have no reason to lie. I never have a reason to lie. Because there is no point in lying. And yes, it's it's hurtful. It's hurtful. Uh, it really is. But I pray for him. I pray for his new wife. I pray that whenever he does get out, that that he can live up to his fulfillment because it's going to be hard. When he gets out, it's, it's going to be hard. I don't know when he gets out. I don't know. I don't think I want to know. I think that whenever he does get out, that it's best for him and, and his new wife to live as quietly as possible. As quietly as possible. And not to include me in anything. You know, one of the incidents that he was yelling at me about, um, I bought a car. People think that I bought it for my daughter, but I didn't buy it for my daughter. I bought it for my mom so she could stop taking the bus. You know, Philadelphia isn't a great place to be taking transportation. I bought the car and my daughter drove the car, which because my mom doesn't drive. And that was the reason why I bought the car. I didn't buy it for my daughter. I bought it for my mom. So my daughter could drive it to escort my mom. Because if I was living in Philadelphia, I would be the one taking my mom any place she wanted to go. But I'm not living in Philadelphia. I'm living 500 and some odd miles away. So I bought a car for my mom. Um, but my daughter was the one to drive it. If you could understand what I'm saying. One of his friends um, took the car and um, got angry with my daughter. I don't know the full detail of what had happened because, you know, she's not going to get the full detail. And I, I try to understand. I want to see if you can see Bear. Oh, okay, you can't see him. I tried to get the information. Only thing I got were pictures where his female friend, whoever, she, she, well, I know who she is, and the man that she was living with stole the car, parked the car someplace in North Philly, opened the car up, open the trunk and everything so that the crackheads could strip the car. Um, he wouldn't tell anybody where the car was. We actually had to get in contact with the Nation of Islam who somehow was able to convince him to tell them 
where the car was. He did and found my car. It was stripped. There was nothing left in my car. So, of course, you know, I had to report that. I had to report it. Nobody said they were sorry. Not even my daughter. But these two people never said they were sorry. You know, um, and not, not, not getting on the fact that they're Muslims, but even the, the Quran speaks of being humble. And yes, I read the Quran. It's a good book. It's a great book, really. The Quran and the Bible, put them side by side. She never said that. She never said that she was sorry for what this man did. I'm like, okay, all right. So insurance company took care of my car, which I'm grateful. Which I'm grateful. My husband of 25 years um, died of cancer. We were taking care of each other. I had had back surgery, and um, I, my back was still raw, still had staples in it. And I was trying to take care of him, and he was trying to take care of me. You know, um, my husband had to go into the hospital, you know, while I was recovering from back surgery, an incident had happened where I had to call my neighbor to come help him because I couldn't help him. As a matter of fact, I couldn't get downstairs. Um, and she got him to the hospital for me as I was making my way downstairs. And I was driven to the hospital. You know, cancer, cancer is a horrible thing. And if I sound like I'm skipping parts, it's it's not. I'm not skipping parts at all. I'm I'm telling my story the way my <laughs> the way my brain um, is doing it. Cancer is a horrible thing. My husband was in the hospital basically for two weeks. Not even two weeks, really. No, not even two weeks. It seemed like we put him in the hospital. Then they sent him to a rehab where they were going to train him to a wheelchair. We got him to rehab. I told him that I would come back with the, the slippers and, and the other pants that he would need to work with rehab. Because I, I knew the shoes that I, or the slippers that I, I wanted to get him, you know, um, they were really soft. And, you know, I told him not to worry, that I loved him and I will see him in the morning. So around 10 o'clock, the nurse called me to let me know that he was in pain. And I'm like, okay, um, relief his pain, you know, give him something to help with his pain because they have to call me. Anything that they had to do for him, they had to call me to get permission because um, since I couldn't stay there with him, I'm like, everything you do, you, you call me first. And then I think maybe 30 to 40 minutes later, she called me to let me know that my husband had passed. And um, that was the, the, the first true punch to my system. when he passed because in my mind I had um, figured out the wheelchair um, we couldn't live in the house that we were living in because there was no wheelchair access 
So I'm planning all this stuff in my mind, and then suddenly the plans had to stop because there were new plans. So I had to bury my husband. He, you know, ex-military. They had the gun salute. A Marine gave me his flag. And that was it. That was it. Um, people went on their way. And as a widow, you do what you got to do. No grief counseling. I didn't think about grief counseling. But I did what I had to do. Two years later, I'm, um, I re-met a person who knew me from the powwow trail. I am Nanakote and Gullah Geech. And I celebrate both heritage. I am not afraid to go to a powwow. Uh, I know my family history. I dance. I enjoy myself. My children now dance and enjoy themselves. And he knew me. When he first saw me, he remembered me. He said from 1995. He was a vendor at my people's powwow. And I call them my people because they were, they were nanocodes. And I'm nanocode. So. And I looked at him. I'm like, okay. So um, time went on, you know, and he called somebody who had my phone number. And this person called me and told me that the chief wanted me to call him. And I said to her, I don't know the chief. And I don't call strange men. You know, so if he wishes to speak with me, and I'm being respectful because he is a chief, he would have to call me. Sorry, but that's how it goes. She said, are you sure? I'm like, yes, I'm sure. He would have to call me. I don't call people like that. If I don't know you, I'm not going to call you. She said, okay. She hung up. Fifteen minutes later, he called. When I heard his voice, it clicked. There was a clicking. There was a clicking. And we started talking, and, you know, we started seeing each other. And one day... um, you know, I, I would travel down to Virginia just to see things. That's what you do because everything is the woman. The woman has a say in everything. There's no um, man to tell the woman in our culture. You know, very respectful. So at one of the powwows, I was, I was just watching and enjoying uh, the people, the air, the atmosphere, the burning of the sage, and fry bread. And he came to me, and he said, you look chilly. Like, I'm pretty good. And he put a blanket (coughs) around me. When the women saw that, when he put the blanket around me, that was an indication to the community that this woman is taken. And I I felt honored, you know, it was the start of the courtship. And then afterwards, you know, later on, down the line, we were married. And my life with him was good. It was like my late husband spoke with him to tell him everything about me. And then he also knew about me because he did a family search. And he knew my family background. He knew where we where we started from, and um, who the person was that was in my family. 
So anyway, to make a long story short, uh, after four and a half years, we went someplace and we came back. He wasn't feeling well. I told him to hold on because he did have heart problems. Told him to hold on. Got to the house. I tried to help him into the house. And he fell down. And I started giving, I called 911, and I started giving him mouth to mouth resuscitation. But he died. He died in my arms. He died in my arms. As I was giving him mouth to mouth resuscitation, I breathed in, and he actually forced his air, his last breath, into my mouth. And then he left. He took his journey. And it was an odd thing how he just went, (sighs) and then he left. When he did that, he pressed his last breath into my mouth. The paramedics had arrived and they were working on him. I went into the house. I got my pocketbook, my shawl. I closed up the house. And I watched the paramedics. And he said, well, we're going to be working on him. I said, okay, but um, I want you to know that my husband has passed away. So they took us to the hospital, and my blood pressure was so high that they actually put me in the hospital. And um, the doctor came to tell me that they did all that they could, but he passed. And I told them, yeah, he passed at 1149. And she looked at me. She said, are you sure? I said, yes, he passed at 1149 p.m. And that's where she called it. No grief counseling again. I just kept going. My family in Philly came down to Virginia. My family in Georgia came up to Virginia. The children had their own little powwow meeting. And it was decided that I will go to Georgia. And I'm I'm kind of glad because I really didn't want to go back to Philadelphia. There was too much sadness for me in Philadelphia. So, went to Georgia. I lived with my son and his family for basically a year and a half before they were stationed elsewhere. So I kept the house going until they would come back. They did. My my son sold the house. They're now living in a cute little house. Oh, I love the house. And I am now living in a little house right now until I until I decide where what I want to do. It's about me this time. Not about anybody else. It's going to be my turn. There's a song by Diana Ross called My Turn. And uh, that's basically my song, you know, My Turn. So right now, I sit on, on this porch. This porch gives me peace, solitude. This is where I pray. This is where I cry. This is where I feel that I can talk to God, our Creator. I can burn my sage. I can play my drum. And I can do my grief counseling. Even though Everybody tells me that I'm not alone. They don't understand that when you lose two mates, and both of them loved me. They really did. 
They showed it. When you lose two, that's a punch that you could never get over. Um, some say, you know, you need to start dating. Like, for what? Uh, there's not a man out there, in my opinion, that could fill either shoes. Um, I wear my wedding ring, and people say, well, you're a widow. You're not married anymore, so why do you keep wearing a your ring. And I let them know that in my heart and in my brain, I'm still married and I'm, I am comfortable with that. You know, you have to forgive me right now because the white dog has found mud and he's laying there. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Come back. Get out the mud. I bet if he was a black dog, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do the muddy thing. Hello, baby. Hello. Hello. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I, he came up to give me love, and I now have dog fur in my mouth. Those of you who have dogs who shed, you understand. <clears throat> you understand what I'm going through. Sit, Papa. Sit. Thank you for the paw. Lay down. Oh, I got muddy paw prints. Well, yeah. Amen. Um, damn, what was I saying? Okay, I know what I was saying. This is my life. I've been through some things, or as people would say, I've been through some shit. Where it was hard. My son wasn't there to see this. My son wasn't there to witness what I had to go through, what my late husbands had to go through. He wasn't there at all. But he would take the word of other people. And every time he would call, it was, it was another slice to my soul because I knew the truth. I lived that truth. Call another slice. Call and another slice. There won't be any more calls. Because I have to protect my own soul. And I am protecting it. I am. I've decided that I've given a lot to other people. I have. Even a house that people destroyed and abandoned. I've done a lot. I've done a lot for my family. I have. Damn it, I have. I've done a lot. And I've taken a lot. But it's my time. It's about me this time. My healing, my dealing with PTSD on top of the TBI. Taking care of myself is foremost now. Not nobody else. Not like, you know, not like I did. I have my two grandsons here right now, and they are wonderful. They are wonderful. They help me. They understand me. They know when I'm tired. One will actually go make up my bed and fluff it for me. <laughs> and the other one will actually walk me into my bedroom and tell me to lay down. That's awesome. That's that's awesome, people. That really is. But now, like I said, I'm on this journey for me. My journey. Or I should say, my life with him. Let's see if it's light enough outside. 
so let me see if I can put the up uh, there he is it's, it's kind of you know you see yeah he's a little dirty because the dog loves the mud and the dirt bear yeah that's my baby all all of him yes there Ooh, can I see your face again say hi no say hi okay he's looking at me like I'm crazy let me take the flash off so it doesn't bother him mm, my big boy my big boy is like a hundred and something pounds now he's mommy's baby yes he is yes he is so this my life with him and that's exactly what it is that's what this is called because it's a journey it's a journey for the two of us me and my service dog yay you ready to work hmm? we got to go to Lowe's you ready to work sit thank you for the paw stay st thank you um, I'm okay I'm okay he does touch uh, when he feels that I am getting nervous thank you for you thank you I'm good I'm good I'm up I'm up okay everybody be safe out there this morning. Be safe out there. People who are going Christmas shopping, guard your pockets. Because, you know, there are pickpockets out here. Professional thieves. Be prayerful. And most of all, oh, the birds are up. And most of all, be thankful. If you're going through something, learn from it. Honestly, learn from it. Don't be afraid to learn from your mistakes or, as we call it, your lessons. Find yourself a prayer corner. And whatever religion you are, you know, whatever religion, just pray to your creator. Just pray. Get quiet in front of him. If you burn sage, please understand that sage is not about cleansing. It's a prayer that you send out. It's a prayer that you send out. You pray when you burn your sage. You know, some people have an idea about sage. But you never know the truth about sage. But I'm telling you, you pray when you burn your sage. Because you're sending up a prayer to the Creator. And He'll hear you. He'll, he hears you. Okay, guys, I love you. Oh, I'm supposed to say, share this, like, and share this video. I'm going to give a shout out to Tita Talks. I love this lady. I do. Lady Nika. I've learned so much from Lady Nika. Spill It Boy TV. He's so funny with the clean up, clean up. I'll be dancing and wiggling. Oh, that's probably the only exercise I get when he does that. But hey, Boss Lady TV of New Jersey. And I'm not shouting out these people for what people call clout. Oh, look, you can also see, now you can see how foggy it is. Um, no, I'm shouting out these people. Because I listen to them. They speak the truth. Um, butterflies still fly. They speak the truth. It's not as they don't, they don't, they're not out here lying. They speak the truth. They don't have any reason to to lead a person down the briar path. They've already been down the briar path. Miss Tita, or Tita Talks, she talks about her journey through drug addiction. And I listen to what she says because it's like my journey with um, dealing with PTSD 
and TBI and the drugs that they want to put you on, you know, because the VA feels that we veterans are little guinea pigs. So a lot of the medicine that they prescribe, I don't take. I tell them, no, I don't want it. I will deal with this my way, how I wish to deal with it. I do take meds because I have to take meds. But I don't believe in taking the psychotic meds. I, I, I do my porch. I do my drumming. I burn my sage. I breathe it in. And I speak to my creator. That's how I deal. And it helps me. But I just wanted to give a shout out because um, they're wonderful people. They really are filled with wisdom, like I said, because they've been there. They've been there. Okay, so once again, this, can you see the white dog? No, but you can see the fog. It's time for me and white dog to um, to go to Lowe's. Papa Doe up. I call him Papa Doe. Sit. I'm getting ready to let him go into the um, house to what we call sweep. Our dogs go in first. We give them the command to sweep. And they go in and they actually sweep. They check. And he'll come back to the door to let me know that all's well. And then I go in. See you later. Have a good one. I love you. Bye-bye.